Hi folks, coming to you from the Black Void. I am here to talk to you about um, live system analysis. So we're going to look at how we can investigate a system that has potentially been compromised or we're not sure if it's been compromised. So we've had some reports of, of a potential security incident and this is how we can go and look at a system while it's still running. So there um, one of the things that we want to know is, you know, has it been compromised? Um, what's the extent of the damage that's been done? And we're going to look at a number of ways that you can explore a live system to investigate what's happening or to catch someone in the act of, um, you know, exfiltrating data or whatever. Um, to just see what's ha actually happening on a um, system. So we're going to talk about the concepts of the technical things that you can do and the kinds of investigation techniques that you can use and I'll record a separate video or videos that will actually demonstrate um, you know how you run those tools and what those tools look like um, just to investigate a system that's running. So first of all one of the reasons why we would want to look at a system while it's still running is because um, you know RAM is volatile so or volatile so the as soon as you turn the computer off everything that was in ram vanishes basically we lose that the state of the system so the only way that we can know exactly the state of the system is to look at it while it's still running and otherwise we might lose information that we won't we won't be able to gather any other way so we can look at all the processes that are currently running on the system and know what resources they're using. That includes the network and files, uh, what information those processes currently hold. Um, so for example, if a remote attacker has gained shell on your system, then there might be the history of all the commands that they've run sitting in RAM itself um, and, as, and passwords in, stored in memory and things like that. And as soon as you power the machine off, all that information is um, is lost essentially. So there could be leads to an investigation that you otherwise might not get. Um, this is, um, you know, of all the topics in the on the security curriculum side, uh, this has a very large overlap with the for digital forensic side of things. Um, and if you are like studying our forensics modules you will um, you know go into more um, you know depth on on some of the topics of uh, you know the forensic investigation side um, but the emphasis is different so on the forensics modules we're looking at uh, specifically from like a crime point of view how you would investigate and gather the the evidence from a machine um, and whereas we're looking at it from a kind of a business or organizational point of view where we have some systems that might be compromised, what can we do to figure out what's going on? Um, and many of the same um, principles and techniques apply. Um, and there are lots of different tools that you can use. Uh, but, you know, our emphasis will be on figuring out what's going on. And um, we will, um, I'll mention some of the forensic stuff around how you will need to decide you know, if you're going to likely to involve law enforcement or you're likely to need to investigate it with, with, with um, you know, if you were actually going to try and track down an attacker, for example, then it's more important that you follow, you know, forensic techniques to maintain the chain of evidence and things like that. Um, but if you're an organisation and you're just trying to get things fixed, um, then you know that might not be your highest priority, um, but either way, you'll want to um, just kind of log all the actions that you're taking, uh, so that if you did want to take further action, um, you you have that option. So, one of the things that we'll be interested in thinking about through this process is understanding that the level of compromise that might have happened. So if you have had a security breach, the integrity of all of the, the data and your environment and everything will depend on what kind of access the attackers have managed to get on your system. So if the attacker has compromised, like exploited a buffer overflow, for example, 
and they manage to get shell or get some um, get one of your processes on your server to start acting um, for the attacker, then um, if that process is running in the context of a normal user, then the level of access that the attackers have is that of a user on your system. So in that case, all of your operating system tools would all not have been affected. And uh, you know you can trust all of your operating system tools to, to act normally. Um, and you you know all the kernel space stuff will all won't have been affected at all. Um, if an attacker has managed to get root access, then maybe your user space tools might be compromised. So they might have managed to replace uh, you know the standard um, tools on your system with um, with trojanized like backdoored or root kitted kind of versions of those tools. Um, but maybe your kernel is still working fine. Or maybe they have managed to get kernel level access, they've loaded kernel modules into your, your kernel, for example. Um, and at th that point, essentially all bets are off. Um, but doing the investigation is still usually fruitful, but you need to be aware going into it that some of your tools might be lying to you. And it's a reason why it can be helpful to take a like a multi-faceted kind of triangulation approach of collecting all the information potentially multiple ways because usually um, even if you have been compromised they, they won't have um, gone to the effort of giving you a consistent lie so usually if they have um, even rootkitted your system so that they've your system is lying to you, usually it won't be consistent, consistently lying to you. So it can basically that is worth just saying up front is that we have to think about the fact that the attackers might have compromised our system and our system might be um, lying to us. So that's one reason why it's safer to run tools from a read-only removable drive or a network mount when there's some question as to whether or not you can trust the tools. So, um, because the software may have been tampered with, you should use a um, like have your own read-only media that has a copy of the tools that you need to do your investigation on it, and then you can mount it into the operating system, um, and you know in a read-only way, so that you can access those tools, um, and you can use absolute file names when typing the commands. So, for example, if you've um, like mounted a, a disk that has your um, binaries in it, then you know here you would use that full path name when running the tools rather than just running ls to avoid using like the trojanized, potentially less trustworthy version of ls that's running on the system that you're investigating. So, your path environment variables may have been altered. Also, that you know when you run ls, it might not even run you know, what's in um, the bin directory, it might be running something different. Um, so yeah, you should use absolute file names when you're doing these investigations. Even that might not be enough if your kernel operating system's been tampered with, um, but this is the most practical way you can go about looking for and collecting the volatile uh, data of your system, or data, if you prefer. So, <clears throat> so, your organization should typically have some prepared tools. So you should create a disk with tools, including the standard commands that you could do use, um, like system commands and things. We're looking at uh, processes that are running and networking and things like that. And any forensic software that you're going to use to do like memory capture or any other kind of triage and capture that you, you might use. And those tools should be statically compiled. So when you write code, um, and you've got, say for example, you write your tool in, um, in C, so a lot of the standard um, like Linux commands and things are written in C programming language. Um, when you then compile those, uh, often they will compile to load libraries dynamically, so that means your C code or your, your final executable code doesn't have to include all of that code that everyone uses, like the code to access a file or to run a pro, you know, 
all that like standard things um, that are part of the C library, for example, usually um, sit separately on the system. And on Windows, that's like a .dll file. Uh, and on Linux, they're .so, like shared object files. And um, when you run a program, the operating system will like link, um, <clears throat> load into memory those libraries and that shared code. The problem is you don't know that all that shared code and everything is trustworthy on your system. So instead, when you compile the software, you can create a version of the software that has all of that stuff in the actual executable file, in the binary file itself, um, so that you're not relying on all the other stuff that's sitting on your operating system when you're running the program. So you basically need to statically compile your tools. <clears throat> and there's a number of, um, you know, uh, uh, disk images and forensic investigation images and things that you can get that they've people have done that work for you, but you can do it yourself as well. So if you do have tools that you need, you statically compile them. Um, and you can use various scripts. Uh, and if you are a large enough organization, you might want to you know build this toolkit yourself for your organization. So you basically prepare some scripts that you use to actually compare your system with what you would ex what the organization expects. So you can you know you can do the things like that we've covered in other um, topics like integrity management, so like file integrity checkers, um, and look at all the running processes, like list of all the running processes, and basically have a, a disk image that you can come in and have a standard set of procedures and tools that you use to do the investigation. So you <clears throat> get some procedures in place that you're going to use to copy all of the relevant um, like evidence off the machine from hard drives and RAMs and things um, to, to you know collect all that information. So the sorts of information that we're looking for is anything that's out of the ordinary. So out of ordinary activity like a user logged in at an odd time. So if someone's on vacation and we're looking and we can see they're logged in, we want to investigate that. Um, and we want to look at any user or program that's doing something unusual or anything being unusually resource intensive. So, so suddenly you're seeing a lot of network traffic or a lot of disk access or just a lot of CPU or, or RAM usage that is not normal behavior. Um, that's something worth looking at. Um, you know, especially at this stage, we're already, um, you know, we're doing an investigation. We're already um, suspicious of the activity. So we want to look at it carefully. Looking at unexpected network connections in particular. So <clears throat> if you can see that there are um, programs on your computer that are talking over the network to IP addresses you, you don't know what they are, then obviously that's a huge red flag. Um, any services uh, that you wouldn't expect to be running or configuration changes, you know, so you're doing your file integrity management, you see files have changed, um, then that's obviously worth looking at. And the sorts of investigative leads that we're looking at are anything like IP addresses, processes, uh, email addresses that we find, um, commands that have been issued by an attacker and all that sort of stuff are things that we want to gather um, and investigate. Um, and, and then at that stage you might want to decide as part of the incident response process that it's safer to power down the machine or disconnect it from a network. Um, and the stage, the amount of live system analysis that you do um, will depend on the business needs. So you might decide, actually, you know, it's more important that we stop anything that's happening right now, in which case you disconnect from the network straight away. And you can do that without having to power off the machine. So you could, um, you know, just unplug it from the network uh, and that will leave processes running, um, but you will lose network connections and potentially Processors will respond to that, including you know dropping connections or ending, um, and so you, you might lose some evidence that you would otherwise see. Um, but it is safer because then you know that it's less likely you've got a malicious uh, um, entity currently accessing your system, uh, like over a network, for example, and issuing commands to your system. So if you disconnect it, uh, that has the potential to stop uh, further harm. So. Um, you know, it depends what's more important. Do you want to really understand what's happening so that you can recover and prevent it in the future? Is it important that you maintain forensically sound evidence for court? 
uh, or you're simply trying to recover to, to continue on with business and obviously um, you will need to do due diligence in terms of reporting, you know, according to GDPR. Uh, there are uh, requirements that if you are aware of a breach, then you need to, you know, you, you may have requirements to, to notify. Um, and so the organizations need to be aware of what their obligations are and build that into their risk assessment um, and incident response process. So it can help a lot of things, including um, just your review process at the end, but also if you're gonna involve law enforcement, you should log your actions. So have a record of what you did so that you, um, while you're doing your investigation, um, and usually it's a good start of that log is to look at confirmed system dates and details that you which system you're looking at and what the dates are. Um, so at an early stage, you might want to take a snapshot of the state of the computer. Um, and you may wish to dump the entire contents of memory, so everything that's in RAM and swap. And then later you'll be able to further query the state that the system's in. So if you can capture that information, depending on the format that you use to capture that information, there are different tools and techniques you can use to actually look at what was happening. So on Linux, it's fairly easy. You can, you can basically do a DD, um, which is a low-level tool that can directly copy contents of a file, for example. And you, depending on the version of Linux you're running, um, you can um, basically DD dev slash mem, and that's raw access to memory if you've got the privilege level to read that file. Um, the, there's, there's also Lime, which is Linux memory um, extractor, which is a kernel module you load into the kernel. Um, that can work really well on newer Linux systems as a way of um, dumping the contents of RAM. Uh, and on some systems you can also access proc slash kcore, which is an L formatted um, core dump of the kernel. And if you do get a core dump for the kernel, um, you can start doing um, things like debugging the kernel and things. Um, so if you do a memory dump, um, you could do it, it would look a little bit like this. So dd uh, input file equals dev mem, output file, you know, write, write to your, your evidence. But it can trigger a system crash, um, depending on, you know, the details of how you've got your system set up and versions of the kernel and things like that. So as part of your incident response process, <clears throat> you need to test um, in advance that these techniques are going to work because obviously what you don't want to do is investigate it a, um, um, you know, during your investigation to crash the system. That's good coffee. Um, <clears throat> so <clears throat> um, if you do want to be able to debug the kernel, you need to copy, um, you know, have a copy of the kernel image and your symbol map um, as well. So on 64-bit systems, you'll have better luck using Lime, which is the um, um, lo it's a loadable kernel module, um, and it, it, it works on Android as well because it's a Linux-based system, the Linux kernel, um, but basically you can use it to do a full memory capture. Um, and it minimizes interactions between user space and kernel space because most of the code's running in kernel. Um, and so you know, it is potentially more forensically sound uh, way of doing that. And also it works well on 64-bit systems. Um, but once you've done that and if you've captured, and, and you know, there are other tools to do, you know, various tools to do that on Windows as well. When you capture what's in RAM, then there's all kinds of things in there that could be useful. So they can be cached file contents. So for example, um, you could have a, a file that's encrypted on the disk, but if a program is running that and decrypting it into memory, then if you capture what's in memory, you could get access to the decrypted version of that file. Uh, you might have passwords, um, that you know have been entered that it are, or that are um, in memory that it's using to access something um, you you know even if you had ransomware for example you might have um, you know there might be something useful there if, you know assuming they're not doing it well with public key cryptography but the but in um, 
you know, there's all sorts of stuff in, me in memory that could be useful and interesting. Um, so it's important to do this in a timely way because as time goes on, so if we've been compromised and then we start doing investigations on the system by running a whole bunch of tools, every time you run a tool, every process basically changes what's in RAM. And the things that were in RAM will get overwritten by new processes and things will get swapped in and out of, um, of swap and um, basically old processes that have ended will um, stop, will basically be, that information will be overwritten um, from what's in RAM. <clears throat> so basically if we've been compromised and things are happening, we want to capture the state as quickly as possible. So um, even just by running the commands to record and dump the memory, you're overriding some information, just the act of doing that. Um, some operating systems don't um, zero memory on a reboot, so as long as you don't power off the machine, but if you do a, a boot cycle, um, some operating systems will leave the contents of RAM in there. So you might even see stuff that was from previous um, time that the operating system was running. Um, but once you have um, the the um, the dump of memory, you can a very quick and dirty thing that you can do very quite easily is just to extract all of the ASCII strings of the text information out of it. So there's obviously a lot of binary stuff to do with the pro you know the machine code that, of the processes that are running and the you know all of the <clears throat> the details of you know the, like data structures and things that will be binary that will require more work to figure out what what it means but if you just just go through what's in was in the ram and just pull out the strings uh, it can be a very quick easy way of seeing all sorts of things that that um can just kind of jump out at you so for example there might be a bash history of all the commands that have been run by the attacker it might just be sitting in ram as a string is if you pull it out and look through it and you look through all the strings you've extracted, you might find all sorts of interesting stuff. Um, IP addresses and all sorts. And you can start um, grepping through um, that uh, you know, dump that you have, like this, and basically just grep through for particular strings that you might be interested in looking for and um, you know, pull it out. So there are a number of forensics tools that you can use to analyze memory dumps. Um, so for example, volatility, you can use to analyze Windows or also Linux memory dumps, and it can extract information like network connections and processes and all sorts out of it. Um, so I mentioned before you can do kernel debugging, but it's not for the faint of heart, and actually I wouldn't generally recommend it considering the amount of effort to reward. If you were particularly keen, you can basically run a, a kernel um, dump, like a binary dump, through a um, actual um, debugger and step through, the kernel, like basically, not step, you can basically take that core dump and, and query all the different data structures, <clears throat> which include process lists and network connections and all sorts. So, you know, if you're keen and you don't mind trying to understand the Linux kernel, you can do that and you can basically load, um, you need like, uh, it will make it your life a lot easier if you've actually compiled the kernel to enable debugging um, and, if, and to have this, the kernel source code available for the version of the kernel that you're running. You can load all of that into a debugger and actually start querying the state. Um, but more likely, um, a good place to start is to actually just run commands, uh, the system commands. and as I said before, you should be running them from a um, read-only media, and you can use a whole bunch of different commands. And I'll I'll um, record a separate video uh, about that. Um, but you can look at the processes that are running on the system, look at the network usage, what ports are open or listening or connected, um, look at network configuration, like looking at the the, the routes and the ARP cache and um, DNS settings and things. And um, I'm always aware of my Australian accent when I start using using these phrases. So um, you might prefer to say roots or um, cash, but um, you, you know 
you have to live with the fact of that. But um, that's just just how I roll. Um, so um, there, look at the files that are um, opened um, by different processes and see exactly what files different processes have opened, what users are logged in, and the rest of it. So obviously um, that's operating system dependent. Um, and there are tools that you'd use on, on Linux or a Windows system to do those kinds of investigations. So you can also look at the processes that are running and you can, um, obviously if you suspect things are currently compromised and the attackers are currently accessing your system, you might want to kill off processes that an attacker um, is uh, you know, connected to. Um, and or or basically what you can do instead is stop the process in its tracks uh, so that you still have the process with all of its memory basically just in like a frozen state and then you can start investigating that process as though it was still like a running process um, and I'll talk about that in a separate video um, so the the Linux kernel and and also the Windows uh, or and Mac kernels are all modular um, the details of the kernel architectures are different in terms of how monolithic or hybrid or micro they are, um, which again, maybe that will be a topic for another video. But basically, they're all modular in that you can basically load code into the kernels. And on, on a Linux kernel, for example, they have loadable kernel modules um, or L LKM, which are basically, it's a um, like a shared object that basically you load into the um, kernel itself, or a KO, and basically it will change the behavior of the kernel. And that includes all the device drivers on, on Linux, basically, all every time you plug in a device or things, it can, it can basically <clears throat> invoke thing, you know, modules getting loaded and things into the, into the kernel. Um, but if you are an attacker and you manage to load code into the kernel, you can change the behavior of the kernel. And that's how a lot of um, rootkits work. Um, and um, you can have a quick look by typing lsmod. And again, it, you know, there's a chance it will lie to you. But that will list all of the modules that are currently loaded into the kernel. So a good thing to do. So a rootkit, um, which I've already mentioned a few times, is malware that hides the presence of tools. So it might hide the presence of files on your system so that when you're looking at what files are there, it hides it. Or they can hide processes that are running from your system so when you're looking at lists of processes, you don't see them. Um, and it allows an attacker to main ac maintain access by hiding their presence. So some of the tools, especially the tools on your operating system, if you're running them directly, might lie to you. And that's because they might be um, acting as a rootkit and hiding, um, you know, compromise from you. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> user space rootkits um, are the simplest kind of rootkit, and basically, it might just be that all of your tools have been replaced or altered. So, the ps command that lists you lists all the processes might have been replaced with a different version of that tool that just hides some of those processes, just doesn't list them out to the screen when, you, you know, when you're using the tool. Um, or hide all the processes with a certain name or a prefix or a postfix or whatever. And so that's a way a lot of rootkits work. Um, or alternatively, in user space, so this is assuming they're not, they don't, um, so in order to replace those tools, um, they, you know, they might have root access, um, but they might be work the way the tools might the rootkit might work is by just replacing specific tools or by replacing libraries. So if you replace the C library, for example, then when every tool, which is most, um, to be honest, when most tools run and they load the the C the common C code library that you know is common across lots and lots of different tools. If it might load in um, a Trojanized version of that, and so then it can start um, basically interfering with all of the tools that might not have changed, mm -hmm. but the behavior changes, um, and also um, that the, it's possible to load in addition to the libraries that are normally loaded, 
include additional um, malicious changes to um, as as a um, uh, separate um, thing, which is like using DLL injection or um, like preloading libraries in um, in Linux. So their user space rootkits um, will um, inject code into a running process. Um, and so in that case, it can basically lie to every process. Kernel rootkits are the more sophisticated rootkits, and they will actually insert themselves into the kernel and change the way the entire operating system behaves. <clears throat> so it might be um, via device drivers in Windows or other kernel modules, um, and that can influence the behavior of any process. <clears throat> um, so in that situation, rootkit's running at the highest level of privilege in the operating system itself, and it can potentially disrupt any attempt at detection. Um, so on, on Linux, a kernel rootkit might alter the system call table, um, which is equivalent to the direct kernel object modification on Windows, which is basically so that when a process um, calls the, the kernel to ask it to do something, it will change the code that gets executed on the kernel side, and basically hook into and um, replace the kernel code that would normally occur. 64-bit versions of Windows require <clears throat> drivers to be signed, um, which has some protection against attackers, but obviously as soon as the attacker gets a um, a um, certificate to write like kernel drivers, for example, then they can write rootkits. <clears throat> so extremely sophisticated rootkits um, can basically install themselves at an even higher level, uh, like a virtualized rootkit. Um, and there are some academic examples and not a lot seen in real life. Basically, um, Blue Pill was a proof of concept, and it moves <clears throat> your entire operating system into a VM, and therefore can influence the system without modifying the kernel. So, very sophisticated. <clears throat> it's theoretically possible, although very hard to detect that that's what's happening through things like CPU timing and the rest of it. So, um, you know, if you have, um, you know, there's a, there's a chance that malware is running on your system and it might include rootkits. So you might choose to look at analyzing processes to look at their behavior. Um, and you can also extract the information from an arbitrary processes uh, memory. Uh, it can be quite time consuming, but you can do some shortcuts by like looking for strings. Um, it can be quite difficult to detect malware or rootkits if they're, you know, good at hiding their presence. Um, but a, you know, a good starting point is to look for known trojans, um, like programs and processes. Check the consistency, as I was saying up front. Look at, um, you know, when you're looking at these views, are you seeing the same information about what's happening, uh, including network connections and files? And check the kernel state. And you can use, you know, anti-malware scanners and things like that. Um, you can go a step further to do reverse engineering. So you can um, do malware analysis. Um, you can do static analysis using things like Ghidra or Ida, uh, Ida Pro. Uh, basically, start looking at the, you know, decompiling and disassembling um, uh, the the software to look at what the software is actually doing. <clears throat> That's outside the scope of this topic. Um, but we um, cover it elsewhere. Uh, and then at the end of the day, if you've been compromised at root or kernel level, <clears throat> it's probably safest just to re-image the system and start fresh and have backups of the actual um, data that you need to save and just get rid of the operating system. Basically start from scratch <clears throat> from a safe image that you've got in the past or um, you know, reinstall your operating system and just get your system back up to it. Because, you know, if, you, if you're in doubt, 
you know that there is um, it's it's safer that way um, but obviously you want to find out and do the investigation to figure out how they compromised your system in the first place so that you can stop it from happening in the future start from um, a, a fresh image of your operating system and within your um, organization you might have a disk image that you start with and then you just load the user data on top of that um, and make sure you're using your file integrity checkers and the rest of it. If you've got a very good, you get in there quite quickly and you've got integrity um, uh, management happening really well and you can see exactly what they've changed and you can see the history of everything they've done um, and then you know it's probably safe for you to just fix fix it, um, those specific things and move on. Um, but if you don't have a good history of what the attack was, how it happened, you can't see a clear timeline of the things that happened, um, then, you know, maybe start, start fresh. So in conclusion, um, doing a live system analysis can provide lots of information that you would otherwise lose. Uh, and it, you can analyze it to, to basically identify what's going on. Uh, but you do have to show caution in, in your approach. Uh, just because we have to be aware and acknowledge the fact that if we've been compromised, um, a live system, there's lots of ways that it can lie to us and um, there's a lot of uh, good reasons why an attacker would want to co cover, cover up what they've done um, and that the system is compromised. So the organization of you know that different organizations will have different security goals uh, but the question is often things like what are the risks and benefits uh, of remaining online um, in face of potential compromise so if you've been compromised um, what are the risks involved in doing your investigation com compared to just like unplugging the network or just unplugging the machine entirely so if you can see that files are actively being deleted and for some crazy reason you don't have a good backup of that information, you might have basically unplug, would, you know. Um, if you can see a huge amount of network traffic, um, then there's a chance you have exfiltration happening at the moment where they're basically copying the information off your computer and network and sending it over the internet to the attackers. That's another good reason why you might want to unplug the, the network, for example. You might leave the machine running but you unplug the network so that the ex exfiltration stops. Um, so there's some decision making to make and hopefully um, the having um, you know listened to this and um, you know encourage you to get uh, basically get hands on with this stuff and 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 have a go. Uh, you will build up your knowledge and skills uh, to to be able to make those decisions and. Um, it's about a reason about it. And um, I'll, there'll be separate um, topics and videos about some of the um, specific technical details that I've just skipped over.